We all know, humans sometimes have psychotic and murderous tendencies. What if I told you animals sometimes, not often, but sometimes show similar behavior? Here is a list, in no particular order, of nine times animals went a bit off script, and decided to hunt and kill humans for fun, or just for some odd reason or circumstance. Let's start off with, the real jaws of the Jersey Shore. Between July 1st and July 12, 1916, a series of shark attacks terrorized beachgoers, and caused the area hundreds of thousands of dollars in tourist revenue. It all started on July 1st, when Charles Vonson, 25 years old, took a quick dip in the Atlantic Ocean. He swam out from shore and was suddenly attacked by a shark. The shark clamped onto his left leg and did not let go. His screams got the attention of nearby tourists and a human chain tried to pull him out. The animal only let go when he got too close to shore. Charles's injuries were too severe and shortly after he bled to death. Five days later, the shark struck again. Charles Bruder, a bellboy captain at a local hotel, was taking his lunchtime swim, when the shark attacked again. It bit off his left leg above the knee, and his right leg below the knee. Lifeguards pulled Bruder to shore, but there was nothing they could do. Shark attacks were unheard of at the time, stories of shark attacks were thought to be mythical tale sailors made up. People did not think a shark could do so much damage, but security nets were put up and boats patrolled the ocean. On July 12, several children were playing in a popular swimming hole along Matawan Creek. Lester Stilwell, 11 years old, floated on his back on the hot summer day, when the shark grabbed him and pulled him under. Stanley Fisher aged 24, along with other townspeople rushed to assist. Fisher spotted the boy's body and dove into the creek to recover it. The shark reappeared and attacked Fisher by biting into his right leg. Fisher would also pass away a few hours later. Only 30 minutes later, the shark attacked another boy, and bit into the leg of 12-year-old Joseph Dunn. The boy, luckily, managed to survive. The shark became public enemy number one, and shark hunters from all over started to look for it. Two days after the last attack, President Woodrow Wilson, convened a cabinet meeting to discuss the shark horror, gripping the New Jersey coast. The shark was eventually caught by shark hunter Michael Schlesser. In the shark's stomach they found human bones, and no further attacks occurred in New Jersey the rest of the summer. The shark responsible for five attacks and four fatalities, turned out to be a 7.5 foot long juvenile great white. Next, we move on to, the brown bear of Sankabetsu. The year is 1915. And the world is at war. In the cold winter of Japan, a different kind of beast was waking up early from hibernation. In mid-November, a monstrous 750-pound Yushuri brown bear named Kasagaki, wandered onto a farm in Sankabetsu. The bear ate some corn, and disappeared. Spooked, the Ikeda family recruited hunters to ward off the bear. Ten days later, the bear returned, and four hunters, shot the bear, and wounded him. They followed the bloodstains but a severe snowstorm forced them to turn back. Convinced that the bear would succumb to his injuries, or, at least keep him away from humans, they left. Little more than a week later, on December 9th, the bear returned in broad daylight, this time to the home of the Oda family. It attacked and killed a baby, then overpowered and dragged Abe Mayu, who was babysitting at the time, into the woods where her remains would later be found. Attempts to recover the body resulted in another gunshot wound inflicted on the bear, but again it survived and got away. Fearing that the bear will return, 50 men guarded the Oda house while a few other were tasked with keeping the women and children safe who were hiding at the nearby Mehuiku home. What followed? was as horrific as it was violent and chaotic. When the guards heard that the bear had returned, most of them fled in fear of their lives. This provided the perfect opportunity for the bear, who proceeded to break through the Mehoiku's window and maul seven people inside. Three were killed instantly with two more dying a few days later. One victim, a pregnant woman, was partially eaten and reportedly begged for her life. Even though the guardsmen raised alarm and the bear fled, it was unharmed this time. Only after this, the Haburo police realized the seriousness of the problem and assembled a 60-strong armed posse, which waited at the Mehoiku home. Probably knowing they would be waiting for him, the bear opted to ransack the Oda family's food stores instead. Finally, on December the 14th, the bear was tracked through a trail of blood and paw marks, and killed while resting beneath a tree. 
This, however, proved too much for the residents of the town of Rokasan Sawa, and they abandoned the town. In trying to explain its behavior, it has been theorized that the bear awoke prematurely from hibernation, and with an urgent need for food during the cruel Japanese winter, turned to the only available food, humans. For the next one, we need to go back to the 1700s. Between 1764 and 1767, an unknown creature, killed over a hundred men women and children, in the rural region of Gévaudan in France. The first report of an attack came around April of 1764. A young woman tending cattle, was attacked by a creature, that looked like a wolf, yet not a wolf. The herd defended her, and she managed to escape. On June 30th, Jean Boulay, a 14-year-old shepherdess, was not so lucky. She was attacked and fatally injured by the same beast. These attacks, occurred sporadically. His favorite prey was children, young women, and also occasionally lone men. Described as an ambush hunter, the beast stalked its prey and seized it by the throat. The bodies of his victims typically had wounds to the head and limbs, and 16 of his victims were decapitated. The terrified villagers offered bounties, and hunters from all over searched for the creature. On October 8, he was spotted at Chateau de la Baume, stalking a herdsman. The hunters followed him into the woods and then flushed him out into the open. Despite shooting a volley of musket fire into the beast, he rose up and ran off. On January 12, 1765, a 10-year-old Jacques Portifax, and his group of friends were attacked by the beast. Not intimidated by the creature, Jacques and his friends drove it off by attacking it with sticks. King Louis XV, was so impressed by the children's bravery that he rewarded them. Placing a 6,000 livre bounty on its head, the king decided to send some of his royal hunters to capture and kill the beast. Still, the attacks continued. On August 11th, 19-year-old Marie Jean Valet was attacked by the beast. Despite impaling the beast's chest, with a bayonet affixed to a pole, the creature managed to get away. Then on September the 20th, Francois Antoine, the king's 71-year-old gunbearer, shot a large wolf near Chases which was assumed to be the beast. The animal was stuffed and Francois amply rewarded. Yet, the attack started again in December, with the beast now showing no fear. With the king ignoring the new attacks as he believed that Francois had killed the beast, a local nobleman, the Marquis de Char, decided to organize a hunt in June 1767. One of the hunters, a man named Jean Chassel, shot a wolf on the slopes of Mount Moucher. During an autopsy, human remains were found inside the wolf, and it also had non-wolf characteristics, as were described by witnesses. Although this kill put an end to the attacks, doubts remained that it was indeed a wolf. With a creature described as, larger than a wolf with a reddish-gray coat, a long strong panther-like tail, a black stripe on its back, and talons on its feet, many have proposed theories about what the beast was. As many of its victims were decapitated, something few animals would do, there are more questions than answers, and the beast of Javadan, is bound to forever, remain a mystery. For number 4, we head off to Africa. It was March of 1898, and the British had just started to build a railway bridge over the Savo River in Kenya. Worker camps, were erected to house the several thousand laborers. But soon, the project took a deadly turn. Over the course of nine months, two mainless male lions, developed a taste for human flesh and went on a killing spree. Called the Ghost and the Darkness, they stalked the various campsites, dragging workers from their tents at night, and devouring them. Over time, the attacks intensified, with almost daily killings becoming the norm. It started to seem like the lions were not killing out of hunger, but were merely killing to kill. The workers tried to scare the pair away by building campfires, and made thorn fences from thorn trees to keep them out. All to no avail. The lions leapt over, or crawled through the thorn fences. At first, only one lion would enter and grab a victim before he left. However, they became so brazen as to enter the site together, with each one seizing a victim. Various attempts to get rid of the pair failed, and workers grew terrified and fled the campsites. As a result, the construction work had to be halted. Getting annoyed with the continued delays, colonial officials came to inspect the project. One such official left with a harrowingly story to tell. Narrowly escaping being killed, the district officer, Mr. Whitehead, 
was left with four claw lacerations down his back. His assistant, Abdullah, was not so lucky and did not survive the attack. Eventually, Lt. Col. John Henry Patterson, the civil engineer heading up the project, took action. He set traps to ambush the lions at night from a tree. Although the traps proved unsuccessful, Patterson was able to shoot the first lion on December 9. The shot struck the lion in its hind leg, but it still managed to escape. Later that night, the lion returned and began to stalk Patterson as he tried to hunt it. This time, using a more powerful rifle, Patterson's shot went through its shoulder and penetrated its heart, thereby killing it. Over the next 20 days, the second lion was shot up to nine times. The first shot came from atop a scaffolding that Patterson had built. Eleven days later, as it was stalking Patterson, it was shot twice again. When they found the lion the next day, Patterson shot it three more times, severely crippling it. Then finally, he shot it twice in the chest and once in the head, killing it. And so, the pair's reign of terror came to an end. According to Patterson's reports, the lions killed a staggering 135 railway workers during that time. The first lion killed measured an astonishing 9 feet 8 inches from the nose to the tip of its tail. Patterson turned the lions into trophy rugs, but sold them in 1925 to the Field Museum in Chicago, where they are still on display. At number 5, we have the Battle of Ramry Island. In 1945, during the last stretch of World War II, the Allied forces realized they needed to gain control of the Japanese Ramry Island in order to invade Burma. After a month-long bloody battle, with Japanese and British soldiers fighting across the island's swamps, a Japanese stronghold fell. Left with no other way to reach reinforcements, the 1,000 troops had to flee across 16 kilometers of dense swamp. With the mud of the swamp severely hampering their progress, the fleeing Japanese troops also had to deal with venomous snakes and spiders, as well as mosquitoes carrying deadly tropical diseases. But even worse, hiding in the swamp, were powerful, fast-moving saltwater crocodiles that can easily grow up to 7 meters. With their bite nearly four times that of the spotted hyena, few people have ever survived an attack by these beasts. And, known for their preference for ambush attacks, their victims are often unaware of the danger until it is too late. And that's exactly what happened to the troops. From the swamp arose, what appeared to be thousands of crocodiles. They started attacking and killing soldiers. With the primeval roar of the crocodiles and the agonized cries of their mates, ringing in their ears, as well as the artillery fire from the British forces, it would have been a horrendous experience for the fleeing soldiers. According to naturalist, Bruce Stanley writes eyewitness testimony, that night of the 19th of February 1945, was the most horrible that any member of the motor launch crews ever experienced. The scattered rifle shots in the pitch black swamp, punctured by the screams of wounded men crushed in the jaws of huge reptiles, and the blurred worrying sound of spinning crocodiles, made a cacophony of hell that has rarely been duplicated on earth. At dawn the vultures arrived to clean up what the crocodiles had left. Of about 1,000 Japanese soldiers that entered the swamps of Ramri, only about 20 were found alive. With over 400 Japanese soldiers reportedly being killed by the crocodiles, another 480 succumbing to disease, exhaustion, or other venomous swamp dwellers, hardly any survivors were left to tell the horrific story of what happened on that fateful night. We head back to Africa for number 6. From 1932 to 1947, in the Njombe district of southern Tanzania, a pride of 15 lions, proved to be true kings, or is that killers of the jungle, and unleashed hell on the local villagers. They killed around 1,500 people before their killing spree finally came to an end. Due to their unusual and uncanny abilities, the lions were often referred to by the local Bena people as, were lions, sorcerers who could take on the form of lions. These lions were so fearless, that instead of hunting in prides at night and usually staying close to their kill during daytime, they would travel by night between villages, and strike by day. Moreover, they would split into smaller groups to avoid detection, and then carry out several attacks simultaneously. As the villagers became more fearful and remained inside their huts, the lions also adjusted their MO. They started to jump on the hut's roofs, claw at the thatching, and simply drop in to get to their helpless victims. 
with the locals too terrified to venture outside to tend their crops, the once cultivated country fell into overgrowth. Numerous attempts to hunt and kill them were unsuccessful. It seemed as if they possessed exceptional abilities to evade capture and death. When a couple of Italian prisoners of war, offered to shoot the lions from a platform placed in a tree, a large male lion simply climbed into the tree, and spent all night clawing at the terrified men who were barely clinging to the tiny branches at the top. Eventually, game warden George Rushby was asked to assist with eliminating the threat of these man-eaters. After several close calls and being nearly killed by this pride who showed no fear or respect for humans, he tracked the lions on foot and killed a few at a time. Finally, after the death of two lionesses, the killing stopped. Rushby noted that these lions lived exclusively off human flesh, and that they would often deliberately bypass vast herds of cattle and instead attack the weak child hurting them. At number 7, we have the sharks of the USS Indianapolis. It was July 1945, and nearing the end of World War II. After delivering uranium for the Hiroshima atomic bomb, the USS Indianapolis, was on its way to the Leyte Gulf in the Philippines, to prepare for the invasion of Japan. Unfortunately, it never reached its destination. Two Japanese torpedoes hit the Indianapolis and caused a chain reaction of explosions that ripped it in two. The ship sank in just 12 minutes, killing 296 of the sailors on board instantly. More than 900 survived, and was set adrift in the Pacific Ocean while they waited to be rescued. However, this was only the beginning of the sailors' nightmare. Life rafts were scarce, and as there were also not enough life jackets, some of the survivors had to cling to those who had. Floating in the cold ocean, hypothermia was a constant reality. But that was not their biggest concern. Within the water were hundreds of hungry sharks. Drawn by the explosions and the thrashing and blood in the water, they came at dawn. At first, they focused on the corpses and quickly consumed them. But when the supply was exhausted, the sharks turned their attention to the living, especially the injured and the bleeding. A frenzied attack followed, and survivors could only watch as mates next to them were attacked and devoured. The blood in the water attracted more and more sharks. The oceanic white-tip shark, an aggressive species known for attacking near the ocean surface, led the attack. Some of the sailors tried to distract the sharks by opening cans of spam from their rations, but this only spurred them on. Learning that they had the best chance of survival by remaining in a group, and specifically in the center of the group, survivors struggled with each other to not be left on the outside. For four days, they were stranded in the water with the sharks never letting up on their attack. The survivors could only hope and pray for help to arrive. Suffering from delirium, hunger, thirst, and the extremes of hot days and freezing nights, some could not continue and committed suicide. Finally, the survivors were spotted by a Navy plane who radioed for help. A few hours later, Lt. Adrian Marks, in his seaplane, dropped rafts and survival supplies. However, witnessing the sailors being killed, one by one, he disobeyed orders and landed in 12-foot swells in the infested waters, taxiing his plane to help the wounded and those who were at greatest risk. Some hours later, the USS Doyle arrived to pull the last survivors from the sea. Only 316 of the sailors that went into the sea survived. Although it is difficult to say for certain how many succumbed to hypothermia, dehydration or suicide. Historians believe at least 150 of the 1,464 crew on board, were killed by sharks. To this day, the ordeal of the USS Indianapolis sailors, remains the worst maritime disaster in the US naval history. At number 8, it is the Chumpawa Tiger. Another notorious man-eater, with its body count recognized by the Guinness Book of Records, as the highest number of fatalities perpetrated by a single tiger. This female tiger at the end of the 19th century, and the first years of the 20th century, was responsible for around 436 deaths in northern India, in the Kumaun region. With her uncannily human use of fear, the tigress realized that even if people are working in large groups, a sudden and loud attack would be sufficient to scare off large crowds, and prevent them from tracking her down. Often, surprising agricultural workers, she would maul one person, and drag the sometimes still living victim to the jungle where she could enjoy her meal in peace and quiet. In one incident, the tiger attacked two sisters who were cutting grass near their hut. She seized the one and carried her off. 
But after pursuing and begging the tiger to take her instead, the tiger let go of her original prey and chased the second sister to a nearby village. Sadly, the first sister was already dead by that time, and the surviving one, never spoke a word again. The fear instilled by the tiger's brazen kills was so great, that days after an attack, a village's entire population would still be locked indoors. And she could still be heard calling several days later, just yards away from her killing ground, as a reminder of her presence. Despite several attempts to hunt and kill her by parties of Gurkhas from nearby Nepal, she always managed to evade her hunters. It was not until the great Jim Corbett's help was called in, that she was tracked down. Corbett was a British tracker and hunter who had killed a number of man-eating leopards and tigers in India. In her last kill, she attacked a teenage girl who was busy collecting sticks with 12 other people. As Corbett was nearby, he managed to catch up with the tiger by tracking her paw prints. He proceeded to kill her in a rocky gorge near her still unfinished meal of the young girl. Recounting the tale of the Chumpawat tiger, Corbett noticed that two of the tiger's canines were broken by a previous gunshot wound, leaving her unable to hunt her natural prey, and causing her to turn into a man-eater. Last but not least, we travel back to Africa. The Ruzizi River, separates Burundi from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda. All countries well known for civil unrest and ethnic wars. As recently as the 1950s, buffalo, elephants and warthogs populated the surrounding areas. But now, only a few species remain. Often found still, are hippos as well as the Nile crocodile. An apex predator that can eat essentially anything in the form of meat. Of all the subspecies, the Nile crocodile is one of the most aggressive. One such crocodile, has become an urban legend as a prolific man-eater, with his killing ground being the banks of the Ruzizi River and the northern shores of Lake Tanganyika. Named Gustave by the French scientist Patrice Fay, the locals refer to him as the Demon Croc. The first report of this notorious predator's attack on humans dates back to 1987. Being described as a large, vicious crocodile with a scar on his head, he seemed to find fishermen and children easy prey. Rumor has it that Gustav had even killed an employee of the Russian embassy while bathing in the lake. Fay, who has dedicated his life to tracking this man-eater, called in help from locals and asked for accounts when Gustav was spotted. Based on the analysis of the crocodile's trajectory and the disappearance of people, and if he had been killing for at least the last 20 years, Fay calculated that Gustav had killed over 300 people. From eyewitness accounts, Gustav is estimated to easily be more than 18 feet long, and weigh about 2,000 pounds. Based on his size, he was originally thought to be 100 years old. But when a photo of him emerged, scientists noted that he had a complete set of teeth, which would be unlikely for a century-old crocodile. He is therefore believed to be about 60 years old, and therefore still growing. Fay and his team of scientists attempted to capture Gustav in the early 2000s. Due to a pending governmental turnover and potential war, the scientists had to give up their attempts at capturing him. Over the years, various attempts by hunters to kill him, even with AK-47s, have been unsuccessful. However, it left him with several scars as well as a deep wound to his right shoulder blade. As crocodiles can go without food for several months, it doesn't seem like Gustav is killing for survival. It appears that he is not just killing humans, he is actively hunting them. Various reports also tell of him leaving human corpses uneaten, implying that he killed them for no real reason. The last reliable account of Gustav was in 2015 when he was seen dragging an adult buffalo to its death after snatching it from the riverbank. In 2019, Travel Africa magazine reported that Gustav had been killed, but no evidence was provided to support their claim, even if true, last of the living dinosaurs, his legend terrifies people, and will live on for centuries to come.